But my question is, why do we have to save so many people? Why don't we prevent the problem? I don't wait for my engine to seize up before I get the oil change. Right. Right. So why are we waiting for these end events, heart attacks and strokes? What I think we need to do as a society, and this is what I do with my patients, is I keep it simple. You want a chocolate bar, have a chocolate bar. You want a Sunday, have a Sunday. You want pizza, have pizza. But get it right Monday through Friday. Now these are short term. You know, I, I heard about the cookie diet. That sounds great, but it's not gonna. <laughs> yeah. It's not gonna work. I want to go on that one. Welcome to another episode of Brain Buzz, where we delve into the fascinating world of neurosciences and brain health. I'm your host, Dr. Kimon Bekeles. And I'm your co-host, Jason Waller. Well, today we probably have one of our most exciting podcasts yet. Uh, we have with us Dr. Dave Degari. Dave, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave is a preventative cardiologist, which is uh, an uncommon title for a cardiologist. I think most cardiologists and most vascular specialists, like myself, uh, our business is to take care of things after they happen. In your case, you're there to uh, uh, prevent things from happening. And uh, a lot of what you do is uh, taking into account not just the heavy medical side and the medications, but also understanding diet and how that interacts with our body, uh, our brain, our general health. Uh, and this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about that link between diet and brain health, dementia, overall health. And I think I cannot think of anybody better in my circle of friends and yeah. physicians that can talk about this issue uh, and understands it in, in such depth. And, and uh, for that, I want to thank you for being here. And uh, let's jump right in it. So tell me a little bit about yourself, and then, uh, then we'll get into the topic. Sure, absolutely. So um, I am a uh, board-certified cardiologist, um, boarded in just about everything cardiology-related, um, and been practicing for about 20 years. And I, ha I have a very busy private practice, so I see a lot of patients every week. So that, that's why I love doing what we're doing right now, because I love to take what I see in the office and in the hospital and learn from it. Right. And the longer I, I practice cardiology and the more patients I see, the more it becomes clear that the health system, if you want to call it a health system, I call it the sick system. Right. 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 Because we don't promote health care. We really fix sick people, exactly, which right. is very different. So the longer I do what I do, I realize we're, we're, all, we're on the wrong track. We got to make a U-turn real fast because 40% of Americans are obese, Right, 40%. And, we're, and those are adult Americans. The kids are right behind us. And we're wow. now seeing children with diabetes um, at very, very young ages. So the beauty of, of what you're doing and what I'm trying to do is we can help people and we can absolutely make a tremendous difference in the current state of affairs. Right, right. And uh, I think you're joining our long line of underachievers uh, <laughs> when it comes to our guests. You know, everybody is board certified in a million things. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and I love your perspective, by the way. You know, the, all of us are thinking in terms of, of course, medical training, right? Medical training is always in terms of how do you take care of the sick? but it's very little to do with how do you prevent them from getting there. Uh, and I always say, of course, you know, I take care of strokes, uh, which is, you know, you're a cardiologist, you take care of the heart. What we do is very tightly intertwined, but, um, you know, we get activated when something bad happens to a patient. And we're, we're all hoping to put ourselves out of business, at least when we're able to prevent a stroke, right? And 80% of strokes are preventable. And I'm sure similar things apply in the rest of the cardiovascular world and general health. Um, and so let's get into a little bit of kind of how diet affects brain health. Um, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners are wondering, both you and I know that when we have patients, one of the things they ask is how can we change our overall diet? How can we change what we do in our everyday life besides medications to get to being healthy? And, and, and so give me a general perspective of what that link is like. Right. So, you know, yes, definitely. But even before we do that, I, I think what's sobering to me is the scope of the problem. So right. we're not talking, we're very U.S. centric, right? right. Um, but even globally, overall, there's 10 million new cases of dementia globally wow. every year. Every 3.2 seconds, somebody is diagnosed with dementia. Wow. So since we've been doing this podcasts and we've been speaking, a bunch of people have been diagnosed with dementia. Wow. Every 40 seconds, somebody has a heart attack in this country and every 40 seconds, somebody has a stroke in this country. Wow. So what does that tell me? 
that tells me we are doing a lousy job as health promoters of promoting health. We're doing an amazing job, especially guys like you, in saving people right. from dying and disabling diseases. Right. But my question is, why do we have to save so many people? Why don't we prevent the problem? Right. 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 I don't wait for my engine to seize up before I get the oil change. Right. Right. So why are we waiting for these end events, heart attacks and strokes? So going back to your initial question, a lot of this has to do with common sense and just habits. You know, we make things very complicated in healthcare, and sometimes we require complicated procedures. You know better than anybody in my field, right? Too. Of course, yeah. Right. So I don't want to. I don't want to dumb it down. Where oh my God, we can solve everything because some things are genetic and some things are unavoidable. So of course. we need Western medicine. I'm not coming on this blog to say that we don't need Western medicine. Western medicine is a miracle. Right. But what we need to do is we can't rely on Western medicine to save our country or the world, right? Because our problems are not druggable. Right. They are not druggable. Drugs are not going to get us out of our problems. Prevention is going to get us out of our problems. And the main aspect of prevention, which we don't talk about in medicine, we right. talk about it all the time on YouTube, right. Facebook, and Instagram, because everybody now is an expert in nutrition, right? And they all know the secret diet that's going <laughs> to make us live to 120. The right. truth is, it's not that exciting. It's kind of boring. <laughs> Diet's kind of boring, and it's not easy. Right. I could take a pill, and that's easy, right? right. But right. you know, to follow a, 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 a and I, by the way, I don't like diet. I like to say nutrition plan. But to right. follow a nutrition plan that it's going to pay dividends in twenty and thirty years is hard for people because a, it's not instant gratification, right. and b, it's hard. And wh and why don't you like the term diet? Why do you prefer a nutrition plan? Because there's no such thing as really a diet. It's a nutrition plan. We have to eat, right? Right. And when we when we use the word diet, we I feel we box ourselves in, right? So the the keto diet, I can't right. eat, I can't eat carbs, right? It implies and, staying away from something that's right. versus having a plan. That's right. The yeah. paleo diet, our ancestors' the diet. Supposedly our ancestors ate. Again, there's restrictions. Even vegetarian, and I have to, full disclosure, I was actually a vegetarian for a while. Okay. Um, that is also restrictive. So, right. so when I say diet, I'm kind of telling somebody, here are your boundaries. Mm. So when I see patients, and I do a lot of nutritional counseling in the office, when I see patients, I talk to them about their nutrition plan, and I try to give them an outline. And one thing that's become very clear, although... The studies are mixed. Okay. A lot of it is correlation, not causation. Mm -hmm. A lot of nutrition studies that people hang their hat on are not even great scientific studies, right. but they're all we have. So we have to use not maybe evidence-based, but evidence-informed. So when we look at some of these studies, a couple of things become clear. So for example, there was a, a study uh, published in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2009. Okay. They looked at um, 23,000 patients, middle age, and they found that if you had a healthy lifestyle, which was defined as a quote-unquote healthy diet, exercise, weight, and free from tobacco, you can decrease your risk of diabetes, typically type 2, by 90%. Wow. 90%. So 9 wow. out of 10 diabetics could be prevented, right? We could take the drugs away. Just by diet alone. Absolutely, with lifestyle alone, Right. And then we can decrease heart disease by 80%, stroke by 50%. Wow. And then we're going to talk about the MIND diet. I'm going to right. tell you how you can maybe, at least, and there's mixed results, but if you follow a, a mostly Mediterranean diet, you're looking at possibly, and I'm not going to say yes or no, I'm not going to say black or white. I'm going to say possibly, you're looking at a, a possible 53% reduction, 53 reduction in Alzheimer's disease. Let me say that again, a 53% reduction in developing Alzheimer's disease that, that based is, on my diet. That is amazing. And, and, you know, I think one of the challenges with nutrition in general is that to some extent it's a moving target. Like you're, you've described it, right? Um, it's tough to study scientifically because, you know, a medication is one pill. You give it to some people. You don't give it to the other half. And you study, you know, you have placebo, you have your control, and then you, ex, you know, execute a trial and you have a result. Is it to study... You have a result, you can promote it. With diet, there's so many little factors that come into play that you can really, you have a hard time studying it. And, and you know, the, the, the studies, all the studies on Mediterranean diet, you know, you have to really look at what they mean by Mediterranean diet yeah. and, you know, what the restrictions are and everything else. And, and I think that's what I find challenging on my end, you know, when patients ask for counseling. Um, and so so how, do you, how, do you, how are you able to really 
get to the bottom of what's important and what's not in you know, a, a general nutrition plan. Right. So w- what I think we need to do as a society, and this is what I do with my patients, is I keep it simple. Right. I mean, the first thing you have to do, and I'm, I'm telling the viewers and listeners, if you're struggling with your lifestyle habits, you're making it too complicated. Right. It's not that complicated. We've like made that. it complicated as a society because it makes money to make it complicated. Right. I could sell you a keto shake and I can sell you a paleo book and a paleo bar. And <laughs> But the joke is these are highly processed foods. Now, let's let's take a step back. The sad, I will use the word diet, the sad diet, right. the standard American diet, the sad <laughs> diet, okay? The sad diet. That's, uh, that's a good way to think about yeah. it, right? The sad diet. 70% of the sad diet is processed food. 70% of the foods that Americans are eating, and I'm sorry for the rest of the world, I'm going to pick on America for now. All right. 70% of the food that Americans are eating are processed. Right. What does that mean? They were altered. They were taken out of their natural form, and we messed it up somehow. Mm-hmm. And, and what's the evidence? What's the warning label that we should be looking at? The nutrition label. A nutrition label is really just a warning label. Right. It's warning you that we did something to the food. When you are in the grocery store and you're buying fruits, do you see the nutrition label on the apple? Yeah, it doesn't do you exist, see the right? nutrition Magical label on the sweet yeah. potato? Why do you think that they it was altered? Do you think it was more for profit, more for uh, sustainability of, of the products? I think both. It, yeah. It's both. So profit, obviously, yes. Yeah. Sustainability also. A lot of the things we put into these uh to the foods, when you look at the food label, mm-hmm. things called preservatives. gum, preservatives, yeah. they allow, you know, when you when you take whole grain and you make it refined grain, you're taking out the outside bran mm-hmm. away, you're taking out the, the, and you're just leaving the grain itself. The issue is bacteria can't feed on that and that promotes shelf life. So yes, it's, it's profit, it's, it's practical, practicality, you know, mm-hmm. you have to ship this stuff across mm-hmm. the country, it has to last. So, yeah. so it's a lot of things. And it's also, you know, the, the, um, the habits and the tastes of the American uh, people, you know, we, we, we tend to like highly processed foods. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, when you look at a food and it has a nutrition label, you really need to pay close attention to it. It's very, very important to understand how to read a nutrition label. I think we should be teaching that in kindergarten. You know, we should be teaching kindergartners how to read nutrition. Are there any certain ingredients that we should stay away from? Most of them. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 I think <laughs> anything you don't really understand what it means, you 100%. probably shouldn't be. Yeah, I mean, some of the ingredients sound like they should be on Breaking Bad. So, hundred uh, percent. So, remember how the nutrition li- the ingredients are are uh, listed. They're mm-hmm. listed in the highest percentage. So, so the, the top five, anything more than five ingredients, probably you should stay away from. It's hard. Mm-hmm. I, look. I eat foods that are processed. I'm not going to say I don't, but I'm pretty good. I, most of my foods are not processed. Um, but you want to look at the nutrition label and you want to see that there aren't more than five ingredients. And if there are, then you have to look deeper. And then you want something. So, for example, grain. You know, So mm-hmm. we're going to talk about diets in a little bit. Right. But part of the Mediterranean diet and the mind diet and the DASH diet, a big part of it is, is grains. I think it's like six servings a week for the mind diet grains. It has to be a certain – it can't be refined grain to be whole grain, Mm -hmm. right? So even the word grain is not good enough. So I think we really need to educate ourselves on how to read nutrition labels, how to approach a nutrition label. It's very Mm -hmm. overwhelming. And it could be very complicated. It could be very deceiving. Very, Mm -hmm. very deceiving. Well, I know they say when you go to the supermarket, you should stay on the outside because the inside is where the processed stuff is. All the outside is where the fresher stuff is. Exactly. So we say that shopping the perimeter. Mm -hmm. Shopping the perimeter. So we want to shop the perimeter. When we're walking in a supermarket, the the closer, think of it as like a black hole, you know, the closer (laughs) you get sucked into the black hole, the worse off. So yeah, Zero aisle is right in the middle, by the way. (laughs) Exactly. So you want to stay, you know, in the quote unquote fresh produce. And, you know, you know, we have to be practical. Most of the stuff we're going to buy are going to have labels. But what I would say to patients is when you're food shopping, you know, make sure at least half the food you're buying does not have a label. So that would be just about everything in the fresh produce section. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. And so so the sad diet sounds pretty sad, I must <laughs> well, say. Well, you want another you want one another two scary facts on this? I'll give Please. you three scary sad yes. facts on On the sad diet, the standard American diet, we consume 130 pounds of sugar a year. Oh, wow. 130 pounds, the average American. So now you wonder why almost half our population has either insulin resistance or diabetes. Right. Um the other thing that's really scary is 60% of 
middle schoolers and high schoolers in their school they have they have soda they have uh, canned beverages that's scary available you mean available in, for... in the school you oh, are wow. it's like taking you know it's like putting uh, drug cocaine in a cocaine den you know yeah, and exactly. say, oh, don't, uh, you know if you need it it's there that is sugar you know? for kids is it's exactly that and, and what are we going to do p for kids who are already hyped up we're going to give them caffeine and sugar isn't that a great way to learn it's horrible right? that wasn't always the case though right because i remember like you know even when we were in school it was you got milk or juice that's right and maybe like i mean i went to catholic school so it was a little different yeah. a, a pretzel and, and that was it and you, and you brought everything else <laughs> yeah and, and honestly it, it, the school system is probably I think the school system is one of the biggest problems we have when it comes to nutrition. And it's something nobody talks about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so bizarre to me that nobody talks about, you know, parents are so involved in their kids' lives. We have helicopter parents. You have to be at soccer practice and you have to play 20 instruments and you have to. But nobody's talking about the nutrition in schools. And I right. think that's for a bunch of reasons. But one reason is, A, it's easy for the parents. You know, it's easy to say, here's, here's, here's money for a lunch and, and, and have a great day. Right. It's harder to create a lunch, especially a, a healthy lunch. But I really think that, you know, if I could have one wish in nutrition, and this is going to sound crazy, I, my one wish would be we have to fix the school system and their wow. nutrition plan. Because then you start from the ground up, obviously. Yeah, because then you're change. not creating addicts right. at a young age. If you give a child orange juice, it's orange juice. It comes from a fruit. It has to be healthy. Yeah, exactly. It's terrible. I mean, for every, another little trick is for every four grams of sugar, that's a teaspoon of sugar. So orange juice, a cup of orange juice has like, you know, let's say 32 grams of sugar, right? That's eight teaspoons of sugar wow. in one thing of orange juice. And you're, and you're giving to children who you want to sit quietly in class and concentrate. Right. Right. right so right. you're setting them up for failure. So nutrition in the schools has got to change. Um, and that's easy because schools are mostly government entities, right? They're public for the most part. Right. So the government can really, you know, make it have an influence or an impact. Outside of that, look, Doritos and all these other companies that are trying to get our children and us to eat their stuff. Right. You know, that's going to be a harder battle. But the school is a no no brainer. You know, <laughs> that's, that's a nice bus. <laughs> yeah. It's a no brainer. We yeah. appreciate the pun. Um, so so of course, like we said, this this diet. Uh, is extremely problematic uh, and challenging, but but how how do we how do we battle that? What are the alternatives, right? And and how do we um, how do we get people thinking about other diets and other nutritional plans to get into better health? Well, there's you know there, there's a lot of ways to do it, but you know unfortunately, I'm going to tell you the way we do it now, and I'll tell you the way that it probably will need to be done. Um, now, I think what we need to do is we need you need to get the government involved. This, right. this can't be a private entity that's that's running the diet show here or the nutrition show. Right. Because what happens is interests creep in. And right. A lot of time it's driven by profit. Right. So you need the government to be really serious about this and we need to start young and we need to keep it very, very simple. Even the food pyramid, the plate is a better, they have the food plate now. That's a better approach, but but we have to keep it really simple. And we have to somehow incentivize people. Right. I don't think it's going to work if we say you should. For example, you should wear a seatbelt. Right. But until the law was passed, nobody wore seatbelts, right? Right. So now we wear seatbelts. Right. So we say to people, you should follow a whole food, mostly plant-based diet. But until we incentivize it, uh, maybe we make processed foods very expensive. Right. You know, prohibitively expensive. Maybe we reward people for losing weight. Right. Maybe we give people vouchers for free whole food. Right. 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 Why are we waiting for people to become destitute to give them cheese? Right. 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 That's perpetuating the problem. Right. Why don't we actually be proactive and say, listen, here is a voucher. You can use it for fresh produce at the store. Right. You know, every every week, 25 bucks per family, 50 bucks per family, but you have to use it for whole, you know, whole food. Right. And the, and the supermarkets or wherever need to honor that. Right. Right. So right. I, I think that's huge. I think if you give people incentive and not personal incentive, but monetary incentive. Right. I think that will work. Maybe we give them tax incentives. Right. I mean, dare I say, uh, you know, if you weigh, you lose weight or you document your physician in your physician's office that you lost weight with lifestyle, maybe you get a tax write-off or you get a tax benefit. A lot of right. cities have implemented soda tax. 
Yes, right. And that's another point. You know, going back to you make things very expensive. Right. You know, right. you make them prohibitively expensive. It would it would probably cut down. Right. And and you know, on, on kind of the same topic, you know, obviously all of us have seen the explosion of the uh, medications that address weight loss uh, most recently, right? And to some extent, it feels that both ends are controlled by profit. You know, profit promotes bad habits and bad foods, and then folks end up overweight. And then on the other end, you're producing medications to address being overweight. And of course, we all see the commercials about Ozempic and Manjaro most recently. Right. So, so how do you? What's your what's your take on that as a cardiologist? Of course, what's what's your what's your take on the impact of those drugs, the effectiveness of those drugs, and the fact that a lot of people are on them these days? And what's the negatives and benefits? Right. So, I mean, what are we going to do? Drug forty percent of the American population? Right. It's They're not. Trying. First of all, it's not affordable. It'll be over a trillion dollars. We won't be able to uh, afford it. My take on it is, they're It's a fantastic breakthrough. Um, but it, 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 it's being way overdone right now. Right. So anybody listening to this podcast has to understand this is a bridge. These drugs are a bridge. Unless you're prepared to stay on an injectable drug for the rest of your life and, and potentially have side effects, and we don't even know the long-term side effects, right. you know, we have to really sit back, take a step back and, and ask ourselves, well, what's the goal here, right? So the drugs work, and I do see them as a, a, a tool to be used by people who are, you know, trying to maybe jumpstart things. Maybe they've been struggling with their weight their whole life and they need something for their, their confidence and to feel better um, and get into the gym. Maybe they're, maybe they're self-conscious about how they look in the gym. So they start to lose sense. weight, they feel better. And then once they get those habits going, we start talking about getting them off the medicine. You know, I don't blame people for being overweight, and some people really need these medicines. I think there's a huge genetic component that we're missing right, in obesity right. medicine, and I don't, I don't think it's so fair to just say to people, you're lazy, you're overweight, you don't exercise, you don't eat, because a lot of these people are trying. I see it in my own practice. I see right. people who are struggling with their weight, and I can see how these medicines might give them that boost. So yes, I think these medicines will have a place to play, but I think they're being overused right now. And I think um, there's a false pretense that this is a panacea. It's a cure. It's not at all a cure. And what you're really doing is you're trading one disease for another. Right. You're treating a disease of obesity and excess for a disease of starvation. Because right. remember, what, how do these medicines work? They're glucagon-like peptide agonists. So they basically tell our body that we are full. Right. So you eat and you're, you're feeling full already and you're eating and you become nauseous. You may have nausea. You may vomit. Uh, abdominal discomfort, you may have oh, wow. diarrhea, all these lovely side effects. Right. You know, what, what makes me nervous is you may lose weight, but you're losing weight because you're not eating. And is, is not eating really the answer here? Right. No, right. the answer is not eating. The answer is to eat, but to eat right, eat correctly, have the habits to eat correctly. Right. And, you know, when you start to take these medicines, what also happens is you can develop sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is, is loss of muscle. Oh, wow. And as we get older, we're finding that sarcopenia is a really strong risk factor for death. Why? Because as we age, we lose muscle mass, we fall, and we break things. Wow. And that leads to other complications. So, is so, it a side effect of the medication? Or, well, or you're not it, eating, and so your it's, protein, it's due to that. you're going to waste. Gotcha. Yeah, you're wasting. You know, that's why they call it, they, they love to name things, Ozempic base, <laughs> you know. You're basically wasting. And um, the other thing people forget is you're not feeding your microbiome. Right. So you're starving and you're and, I, and it'll be really interesting when they I don't think there are studies done yet, but they should. Where if they check the microbiome on these agents, I wonder how it changes. And I, I'm pretty sure you're going to see bad things with the microbiome. Of course. Now, there and, have been some benefits to uh, from a cardiology standpoint that a lot of people are unsure of. And you hear different things in the news. Can you touch on that? Yeah, absolutely. So these agents have been studied recently um, in a trial. And it was interesting because they weren't even studied in diabetics. They were studying in, in patients with risk factors for heart disease. And if I remember correctly, it was about a 20% reduction in heart attack, death, and stroke. Oh, wow. And that's a relative risk reduction. That's not absolutely good. But, but there, look, we have data. These medicines will help people. But it's not the panacea that we're seeing on Instagram and Facebook and on The Real Housewives and you know, right. everybody's on these medicines. That, and it's sad because there's a shortage now. And the people who actually need the medicines are not getting them. 
do we know why there's a reduction? Is it because a lot of people are just saying because, well, you're losing weight, so that's why there's a reduction. Is there is it because of the medication in any, in any way? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if it's, it's the fact that we are binding to the glucagon receptor. I don't know if it's uh, a fact that they're losing weight and their blood pressure is going down and their cholesterol is going down. Mm -hmm. My feeling is it's probably the stuff that's related to being overweight mm. and what's associated with it, the, the glucose, the blood pressure, and the, the cholesterol. So yeah, it's, it's really complicated and these, these medicines are still relatively new. Um, but I'm nervous that we're gonna find un, uh, side effects that we're not prepared to deal with. And now we're gonna have to wonder you know, who's at risk and now we have to take all these people off the medicine. So I think, I think the medical establishment has to be a little bit more responsible. And we have to be more mindful on who should be on these medicines and who, who should we maybe refer to a nutritionist instead. So you said we have to be more mindful. Um, well, the MIND diet, um, it's kind of seems like it was made for this show. Um, can you go more into that and kind of just tell the listeners what's involved with that and break it down? Sure. And uh, the MIND diet stands for, it's actually the MIND diet is a combination diet. It takes the Mediterranean diet, which most of the listeners have heard about, right. and it takes a diet called the DASH diet, which a lot of the cardiologists may have heard of. Uh, it's dietary uh, interventions to stop hypertension, and it combines those two diets, and we come up with the MIND diet. So, so the MIND diet is the, let me see if I have it right, the Mediterranean DASH, DASH diet intervention for neurodegenerative delay. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah that's a fancy way of saying... We're going to try to keep your brain healthy, younger. healthy, right? Wow. Exactly. And it's it's a really neat concept. Um, it was a study that was performed in Chicago, okay, and it was about a thousand participants between the ages of fifty eight and ninety eight. And what they did was they gave these uh, participants a questionnaire, and I think it was either once or twice a year. And there were categories on the questionnaire, and the categories would be like. How many whole grains do you eat a week? How many berries do you eat a week? How much fish do you eat a week? Blah, blah, blah. And then they give you a score. They call it the mind score. And the higher your score, the better you know, you're doing with your, your nutrition plan. And what they found was, it was really kind of interesting. If you had a high mind score, you had a uh, seven and a half years younger cognitive age. No way. Yeah. So cognitively, you were about seven and a half years younger than somebody who did not have uh, who did not have a high mind score, had a low mind score. And over what period of time did they study these? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it was over. I want to say over eight years. Oh wow. Yeah. So so really, they looked not bad. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. The the, the reason why I don't know that. Um, Cold is that the Mind Diet had other offshoots from the study, right? Right. And they, they had multiple do. publications. So that was the main publication that got the mind diet on everybody's radar screen showed that people with a high mind diet score had a decrease in Alzheimer's dementia by 53%. Wow. And people with a low mind diet score lower is around 30 or 35%. That's so, amazing that you can treat something like that with nutrition. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I think it's, I think we all know that we should be doing this. Right. I don't think we'll ever get the best evidence to do it. I mean, there were other studies after the MIND diet that were not as robust. There was a study that was published in the England Journal of Medicine. But at the end of the day, I think we have, it's like a court case. I think we have enough evidence. Right. We don't have the smoking gun. But I well, think we, we can convict. We can convict. I think we have enough evidence that the MIND diet, the Mediterranean diet, the, a whole food, mostly plant-based diet, right. it works. And, and so for our listeners, I'm sure the number one question that we're going to get after this podcast airs is, that sounds amazing. What, you know, what do I do to follow the MIND diet on yeah. an everyday basis? You yeah. know, and in general terms, of course, it's, you know, the specifics, but, you know, how do I change my lifestyle? How do I get into this nutritional plan? What do I do? Yeah, it, and that's a great question. It's funny. That's the question I was asking when I was reading the mind that, okay, great. We have the data. We have some data. How do we apply it? How do we make it? Um, how can we scale it? How can we make sure a lot of people can get on this plan and, and hopefully see the benefits? And it's actually really easy. The mind diet, you can Google mind diet and they have, um, they'll, they'll tell you the, the, the meal plan. And they will tell you there's 10 healthy foods, there's five unhealthy foods. And then under the 10 healthy foods, leafy green, uh, other vegetables, berries, nuts, beans, lentils, 
um, whole grains, fish, poultry, and wine. And wine has a little asterisk next to it. But, you know, you can Google that and, and there are charts that say, okay, these are the whole grains you should be eating. Right. Or, you, or, or we, these, would, these would count as a whole grain. These would count as berries. These would count as nuts. And it's really simple. And then they tell you how many servings a week you should have. And it's not that many servings. It's actually a very doable diet. And the way I see it is if you do this for a month, after a while, you're not even going to look. You're just right. going to know. You're going to know what you like to eat because I think that's half the battle. People don't know. And is that in addition to your other stuff that you're eating, these servings, or is it just exclusive that you just follow? This is exclusive, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff here. Like gotcha. You could find something for everyone. Right. And then the Mind Diet has five unhealthy foods that you should avoid. So there's 10 healthy and five unhealthy. And the five unhealthy are red meat, fried foods, um, solid butter or margarine, and sweets, um, and cheese. Right. So those are the foods you want to avoid. And then the 10 groups. Remember, these are there's a ton of stuff here. In each group, there's like 10 things you can have. Right. So you have, there's something for everybody in this diet. I just think people just have to know where to look. So you go on Google or where, whichever search engine, you put in Mind Diet, and you'll see there's a lot of information charts you can follow. Right. And, and what, is, um, what is the thought process behind how does the Mind Diet have that impact on dementia? And uh, is, it, is it a vascular? Because, of course, we know there's several categories of dementia, right? There's the, the general kind of idiopathic, or we don't know how it happens generally in general terms like Alzheimer's or, um, you know, kind of the, the general neurodegeneration aspect. And then, of course, there's vascular dementia. Multiple strokes can cause cognitive impairment and then other types of dementia. Is it, does it apply across the board? And what's the mechanism uh, by which it does? Yeah, so that's why I don't like diet. I don't like the word diet. I like nutrition because it's like a it's like a, a symphony. It's like an orchestra and a symphony. You know, right? You need everybody. Right. You need all the instruments. Right. So it's not. There's no superfood. Uh, right. If you're watching this show, there's no superfood. We need to get that out of our brain. There is no superfood. There is a conglomerate of foods right. that together may create a super effect, but right. there's no superfood. So going back to your question, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it's the, it's the many different things that this, this nutrition plan offers, the antioxidants, the uh, phytochemicals, the polyphenols, hundreds of things, and probably a lot of things that we don't even know exist. Right. Um, and also maybe it's also that there's a lot of chemicals that are not in this nutrition plan right. that are in processed foods that can be hurting us. So it's not just about a, a matter of promoting health, it's also avoiding quote unquote poisons. Right. And, and it sounds like a lot of it has to do with general inflammatory state, like yeah. some of the stuff that you described. But I'm sure, of course, general cardiovascular health is being affected, at which point you're not having much atherosclerotic plaque, you're not having a lot of strokes. So I think to some extent, it's probably across the board. Like you said, it's not one thing that, you know, that's it. It'll have an impact. It's the combination of the effects of generally making your health bringing your health in a better state. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I think it probably is, if you would have pressed me on one thing, I think it all goes down to a blood vessel. Right. You know, I mean, va vascular health is critically important. If you look at the things that are killing American people worldwide, you almost can always go back to the blood vessel. You know, it always comes back to the blood vessel. And probably a lot of the things we're still trying to figure out ultimately will be a vasculopathy or, or a blood vessel disease. Right. So, you know, if we think about, I always, it's funny, when I see patients in the office, I always talk to them about their blood vessels. You know, you want to think from a blood vessel perspective and what is their age? What is, what is your vascular age? Right. Right. So, right. you know, you might be 50 years old, but your vascular age is 30 and that's wonderful. And you may be 50 years old and your vascular age is 80. And I think, right. I think we need to know that. We need to define that. And that's right. really important. And how can you find out your vascular age? So what I do with my patients is we image. It's very important to look. I, you really can't guess somebody's vascular age. We do have risk scores, the Framingham Heart Study, the Randall's Risk Score. They're, they're good. They're not great. And I always tell my patients, why guess when you can know? Right. So we use imaging such as the coronary calcium score, the carotid ultrasound, and we look to see if there's plaque building up. And then what's interesting is we have databases where if I perform, one of my interests is coronary calcium scoring. Right. Because we're able to predict somebody's risk of having a heart attack in the next five to 10 years fairly reliably. I mean, we can tell you based on your score if you're low, medium, or high risk. 
And then based on that score, I counsel people on what to do. So if somebody comes into me, and I see this all the time, I mean, I have patients, they're the picture of health. I have tennis pros, I have marathon runners, I have executives who are working out all the time, right. and they are loaded with disease. Wow. And they didn't even know it. And then I have patients who you think they're a disaster, and they have all the risk <laughs> factors in the world, and I'm, I'm, and they smoke, and I'm scared to look, and they may not have as much disease. But you see the genetic impact there. A hundred percent. You need to look. You know, it's like, would anybody ever say to you, oh, you don't need a colonoscopy. Right. You look good. Yeah. Right? You don't need a mammogram. You look good. <laughs> no. You need to look. And, and what I always try to impress upon people, and I think it, it goes with brain health also, is we need to look at the blood vessels. Just like we look at the colon and we look at the uh, uh, breast tissue, we need to look at the blood vessels. And I would argue we need to look at the blood vessels more than anything else because it is the number one killer. Right. Right. So, so the government, if you don't order a colonoscopy on a patient, it's almost malpractice if they right. fit the guidelines, right? right. Or a mammogram. But if, you're, if you don't order a calcium scoring or vascular imaging, nobody says anything. So you want it in more preventive A hundred percent. And I'll give you an interesting fact. Every Please. president of the United States, before they take office, gets a coronary calcium score. No way. Everyone. Every astronaut, before they go into space for NASA, gets a coronary calcium score. So I always tell my patients, if the president of the United States, <laughs> theoretically one of the most important people in the world, in the free world, right. is picking one, one test, I mean, they got a lot of tests, but major vascular test. They can do it's any consistent, test. Right. If it's good enough for the president, why isn't it good enough for you? Why are we not screening people? It's a right. very inexpensive test. There's almost no radiation. It's 10 chest x-rays, same as a mammogram. Right. Right. And it takes all of five minutes to do. Wow. So, so vascular health, I think at the end of the day, that's going to be the connection. I think it's the diet, the, I should say nutrition plan affecting vascular health. Right. Yeah. So for someone who's doing the mind diet, because th this happens, I know you want to say diet, but um, if you're on the mind diet and, and how long before you start, do you, do you think before you start seeing results? Mm, that's a great question. The honest answer is I don't know. Um, you know, it depends on the diet. You know, the keto diet, for example, you see results fairly quickly, mm -hmm. you know, after you get the first, the first, after you get the phase of wiping out the carbohydrates <laughs> and being ketone dependent. Essentially, um, it's hard to say. I would, in my own experience with my mm -hmm. patients, a couple months. Okay. There are some studies that show, and I've never really looked into this, but studies have shown that a habit takes about 66 days to form. Oh, wow. Yeah. So maybe it's two months and maybe that's why. Because I do think you're, you remember, you're changing your brain mm -hmm. chemistry. You're changing a lot of stuff here. You're right. changing your microbiome. And the microbiome signals to the brain. Mm -hmm. it, the microbiome is the largest immune system we have. The, the lining of the intestines are the largest immune system. That's where we see more immune cells than anywhere else. Right. So there's a, there's a real connection. When you change your diet, you're changing physiology. You're not just changing how you look in the mirror. You're changing how you process dopamine, right? So sh people who are, quote unquote, sugar addicts, right? They have these cravings. Mm -hmm. If you have cravings, this is a dopamine issue. Your body is looking for sugar, almost like a hit with a drug addict, mm -hmm. you know, and you're going to change that when you implement something like a Mediterranean or mind diet. You know, right. You're really changing brain chemistry. Wow. And that's a whole other discussion. Now, now if, because you, you had mentioned the keto diet, like that's very strict. And if you get off of that, you, you like lose the benefits. And yeah. every you know around the holidays, it's common for people to you know you go to a party or you have holiday parties or whatnot. So with the mind diet, how detrimental is it if you have a, you know what people call cheat days? It's a great question, and I love that you asked me that because one thing we have to be is practical, mm -hmm. right? We're not perfect, and we're also organisms that seek reward, right? Always, we are evolutionarily geared for reward. Where usually it's reproduction and food and. But you must give yourself some slack. You know, my problem with my patients who are not successful initially, most are, is that they set the bar too high. You don't have to be perfect. And I always tell my patients, get it right Monday through Friday to start. Well, Monday that, through Friday. Because that's what happens a lot. People are, are doing something or, you know, they're having a bad day and they, they cheat or they're just like in, in a rush and they're like, I'm going to have a piece of pizza for lunch. And they're like, well, 
now my day's screwed. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have whatever for dinner. Yeah, and then I'm gonna, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think you need to frame it. The, the one thing you have to understand is you have control. You're in control, right? Nobody's telling you to do that. You're in control. So I tell my patients, have a day where you can have whatever you love. You want a chocolate bar, have a chocolate bar. You want a Sunday, have a Sunday. You want pizza, have pizza. But get it right Monday through Friday. Now, if you're having a hard time, you know, somebody's giving you stress at work, um, and you feel Throw like, the chocolate bar out. Yeah, exactly. Well, I never do that. do that to you. I'd rather you do that than eat it. But uh, you, would, you, would, you would do it just for the chocolate bar. One hundred percent. I'll take exactly. the chocolate bar anytime. But you know, cut yourself some slack. So if you're really stressed out and you really feel that you need it, go ahead and have it. But stop. That's it. You know. And I would say if you're allowed two reward meals a week, that's one of them. You used it up. You have two passes a week. Use one up. And, and it's, it's not good. Like you said, your, your body's seeking something. It, it, it's not going to really throw off everything? No, it's not. And it's really hard because when people go from the typical American highly processed diet to more of a whole food, mostly plant-based, what we call plant-forward, a lot of it is those cravings. They still have those cravings. So we, I give my patients tricks. So one trick for a sugar craving is berries. Mm. Berries are wonderful. Right. You know, if you have a sugar craving... Take a bunch of berries, and if you want to put a little, you know, Greek yogurt there, that's fine too. But berries are like, I have so many patients say, at night, I need that. After dinner, I need that sugar. I'm watching TV. I want that sugar. And I always tell, berries are the go-to. Right. You know, if you have a right. sugar craving, berries. Sweet potatoes people love also because they, they're, they're sweet, and they also can fulfill that sugar craving. So that's another little trick. But the key is don't overdo it. You know, have a couple of berries. Try to get to sleep because the longer you're watching TV and you're up, the higher the probability you're going to you're going to cheat. And always reward yourself. You know, tell yourself, oh, man, it's Wednesday. I can't wait. Saturday, I'm going to have my whatever it is. Right? Don't, don't deprive yourself. It won't work. It's not sustainable. The reason why the keto diet doesn't work is, it is it's simply not sustainable. We are not meant to be driven by ketone bodies. That's not our body's primary fuel source. Right? Think right, about it. Right, it's right, not even our primary. Just look at evolution. It's we a are starvation not, response. Yeah, it's a right. starvation response. It's not normal. And the body likes homeostasis. The body doesn't want to be extreme, and the keto diet's extreme. So study after study published in reputable journals, New England Journal, have shown that keto diet will last, but it's not sustainable. Definitely not sustainable more than a year most people. Yes, you're going to hear those ketone, zeolitone. I once got through one day. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, tried, I, I, I tried it for a couple of days just to see what it was like. It was miserable. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things is um, that I think you made a point that I want to stress out. The most important thing with everything, but in particular with nutrition, is balance. You know, the, a lot of these options are extreme. you got to go this way and, you know, deprive yourself of all these options. Um, but balance is important. And from what I'm hearing, the MIND diet... Um, doesn't really restrict any foods, but it changes the percentage of those foods in your yeah. diet and how at the end of the day, it's a balanced diet. You yeah. need that balance. It doesn't say you should never eat red meat, you know, maybe yeah. once a week, but, but, you know, you're creating this balance. Like you said, the homeostasis is where um, our organisms thrive. Yeah. And, and frankly, one of the most exciting things for me listening to this conversation is, you know, we all, of course, we deal with dementia a lot in the brain world and we get questions uh, about dementia from our patients all the time. And there's not a lot of good tools we have, at least on the medication side, right. to address dementia. And to some extent, once the brain starts malfunctioning to that level and you start losing brain cells, it's too late to intervene. And I think that's why we haven't found a good medication that can address dementia, right? Yeah. It's because things are already, already too far gone by the time you decide to intervene. But this diet appears to have an impact down the line um, at least to a large extent, based on the studies we see. And it's maybe the most promising thing we can do, at least today, to address that risk of dementia down the line. Have we seen somebody with dementia have any positive results if their diet was switched to this? Man, that's such a good question. I'm not aware of that, but it, it, going to your point. I think it'd be unlikely, right? Yeah, I, I think you're right. Because I know a lot of people who are, you know, a lot of caregivers who are dealing with that, you know, we get calls in the office all, all the time. time, right? Yeah. And that's going to be a big thing. They're like, oh, this is going to be the cure for my mom or my dad. Yeah. Which not, is not. That's Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think, I think the issue is once you get to the point, mm -hmm. it's like anything. Listen, look at any organ, liver. Once it's fibrata, it's fatty liver. That's a whole other discussion we could talk about. But fatty liver is reversible. Right. You know, I think it's like 40% of the population has a fatty liver. And it's the number one cause for liver transplant. 
in this country. It surpassed hepatitis. Wow. And it's reversible. It's reversible. And it's reversible with diet. And it's reversible with weight loss. And it's, it's probably the next big epidemic, you wow. know, the silent epidemic. So, but once the liver becomes fibrosis, it's too late. You know, heart, once you have a heart attack and the heart's dead, right. you can't make it stronger, right? Same Dementia the brain. is probably yeah. the same thing for the brain, right? So again, the goal here is, and anybody watching this and going back to your initial question, is it reversible? I don't know if it's reversible, mm -hmm. but I don't have evidence and I don't have good proof, but I would bet money that you probably will slow the process down. It's never too late. I was going to say, it might stop it from progressing uh, somewhat. We don't know, My but best it guess hurt. is it can't hurt. Yeah. I mean, what, I mean, you're going to put people on medicines that don't really work. We know these meds, you know, we try, but they don't really work. Our At least not for forever, long, right? right? So they help initially, but initially. then obviously the natural process continues. Right. So a lot of people watching this program, they may have a family history of dementia. Right. So my recommendation would be try now to get into these habits. The mind diet's just the diet. Remember that other study that I quoted, they looked at diet, but they looked at exercise, they looked at weight, and they looked at tobacco. Right. So yes, diet is very important, but make sure you get the other stuff right too. Don't don't use any tobacco. Do not use can, uh, you know even cannabis has been shown to be uh, detrimental for the heart recently. That, that wow. was well, well established. We had that question in a previous episode of the podcast. People were, were asking whether, whether cannabis had any relationship to cardiovascular health. And we were saying that, of course, it's very likely. But tell us about this. Yeah, I, don't, I, 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 I read it briefly, but there was a higher incidence of vascular events. But I should come Which back. Which does make we, sense, we should, we should do a deep dive on that. Too, Absolutely. You know? What about vaping? Terrible. Because I looked at vaping everybody, everybody thinks I'm not going to smoke terrible, a cigarette. Terrible. I'm going to suck on this little machine. Yeah. And it's going to be. I mean, better. the vaping with nicotine terrible. I mean, you're mm -hmm. just trading one nicotine product for another. The vaping without nicotine, the problem is there's still a lot of chemicals that we just don't know the long term effects. I, I just and then don't. People will vape cannabis too now. Right? Yeah, it's all. I mean, there's no free lunch. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's not. I wouldn't do it because you think it's healthy. Let's put it that way. I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't do these things because you think you're helping yourself, or you're protecting your heart and brain. You're probably not. And recent studies say you're definitely not. And they're also exploding in your hand, so. Yeah, lots of things <laughs> go wrong. It's nice I'm to have. at risk now. Right. It's, it's nice to have 10 digits, you know. Yeah. It's, but, you know. Fourth of July. Yeah. But I, I think, like, the exercise part is really important. And my personal feeling, because I see so many patients. I've seen patients with terrible disease reverse a lot of their disease and their risk factor. I've taken patients off almost all their medicines with weight loss. Literally, I've had a couple of patients, they were on half a dozen meds, now they're on nothing. And it was because they adopted a whole food diet, not, uh, sorry, nutrition plan, not a diet, not a mm -hmm. gimmicky diet. And they started exercising and they didn't smoke and their weight came down. And you know they're like different people and they never want to go back. That's the other thing. Once people start to feel they're getting healthier and they look better and their confidence goes up. They never want to go back. It's not worth it. Right. You know, they almost always continue. And I think, you know, what you need to do is take baby steps. Don't overdo it. Just, just a low, make it easy. Keep it very simple. Right. Right. Maybe Jason, we want to go into some uh, questions that we have from the audience. Sure. I mean, uh, we covered a lot. <laughs> I bet. Maybe um, we'll cover some of those questions. Maybe yeah. Good. I mean, we did talk about, um, does the mind diet principles align with any of the popular diets? Um, you had spoke about vegetarianism, the Mediterranean diet. We know that definitely does. Uh, paleo, keto, anything like that? No, I mean, when I think of the mind diet, I think the opposite of keto. Because remember, the mind diet, the five, one of the five foods that you shouldn't be eating is the stuff that keto people love, right? Meat right. and cheese and butter. And, mm -hmm. you know, isn't it so interesting how... You can have people promoting this other diet that is in such contradiction uh, to the mind diet. The exact opposite. I, you know, it's amazing. It's the <laughs> well, exact I, I opposite. I think what you, the, one of the points that, that you drove across that I got out of it is the mind diets, the long term. These are short term. These are short term. You know, I, I heard about the cookie diet. That sounds great, but it's not going <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> okay, work. I want to go on that one. <laughs> juicing. So yeah. juicing is another thing. I can't stand juicing. It drives me crazy. Right. Think about what you're doing when you juice. You are taking all the nutrients out of the fruit or the vegetable. Celery juicing is very popular. Right. And you're just taking the juice. You're taking the fiber out, probably the best part. Right. You're taking all the nutrients out, all the antioxidants for the most part. Well, also, you, you can eat so much more now of that because you broke it down. Yeah, but you're just drinking the juice. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, you're going to lose weight. There's nothing there. 
But to me, it's almost like being on the newer medicine. You're starving yourself. It's a starvation right. diet, really. So, you know, anything that looks too good and too gimmicky is not going to be sustainable. So those diets you mentioned, paleo, I don't know enough about paleo. Mm-hmm. I, I covered it a long time ago. I don't really know much about it. I don't know too many people on it. But I, I just don't like, I don't like putting a tight, I don't even like putting the mind diet. I don't like saying the mind diet, but it's just easy for people. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think the, the mind diet is definitely, the difference is sustainable versus probably less sustainable, including being a vegetarian. Being a vegetarian is a whole other hot topic. And I have patients who are vegetarians and a lot of vegetarians are very, very healthy, right. but they have other issues. They don't have DHA, so they mm. have to take in DHA. They right. will have alpha-linolic acid, which is a fatty acid, but it's not a marine fatty acid. The DHA is the stuff we, we think of with the neurons in the brain. Right, and right, right. You know, and then they have B two. They could have B twelve deficiency. Of course. Yeah. So, so all these other diets. But when you're on a diet that's complete, like we were talking about before, the deficiencies really don't exist. You have to think: if I'm deficient in something on this plan that I'm on, is that the plan I should be on? Would right. the body really want you to be on a diet that would have any deficiencies? I would say no. Probably not. I would say no. Well, so, speaking of deficiencies, um, you know, one of the questions would be. If you have allergies um, to one or more of the major components, like say fish or olive oil, can you still do the mind diet? Absolutely. It, nothing is black or white. I would argue if you did half the mind diet, you're doing fantastic. So you don't have to worry about substituting. You can just admit. You can. It depends how far you want to take it. So yes, you can supplement. Again, when you look up the mind diet, you'll see in the category. Mm-hmm. There's lots of different types of oil, you know, lots of different types of foods you can have. Olive oil is kind of a staple. I, mm. I would wonder if avocado oil would be a good, would be would be a good supplement, but they'd have to look into it deeper. But yeah, I mean, I would not say, oh, I'm allergic to fish, so I can't do the mind diet, or I can't do, the, I can't follow the Mediterranean nutrition plan. I would still encourage people to do that. Yeah, so it sounds like as as much as you can do, you'll get some benefit. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And so maybe we'll go into some of the other uh, questions that had to do more with the general cardiovascular risk uh, and, uh, and brain health. So, of course, we have uh, aspirin, as is always a hot topic with you guys, both of, course. Both of you. Yeah. Um, what aspirin doses, if any, would you suggest to balance managing CBD risk against bleeding risk contributing to microhemorrhage strokes in older adults? Yeah, I guess I guess I'll, I'll, I'll let you tackle aspirin first, and then I'll, I'll tell you what I think about aspirin. Yeah, so aspirin is a, it's a balancing act. So you have mm-hmm. to figure. I think of it as a scale, the scale of of clotting versus the, the 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 part of the scale that's clotting and the other part of the scale that is bleeding. And aspirin is very confusing because the United States Preventative Task Force recently said people over the age of I think it was seventy or seventy five shouldn't be on aspirin, which I thought was ridiculous. Right. Because how can you generalize for an entire population? Just based on an age. It's crazy. Yeah. And I have patients who are seventy or seventy five and they have a coronary calcium score of a thousand. I had a guy yesterday in the office, his coronary calcium score was forty nine hundred. Now understand four hundred is very high. So, and he's not on aspirin, but should be, he be on aspirin? Well, yeah, probably. Right. Right. And then I have people in the office, they don't have any vascular disease who are on aspirin. Should they be on aspirin? Probably not. Right. But I don't think you can say everybody should do this and everybody shouldn't do this. And I think it's really important because what happens is people will take liberty with what they're reading in the media. And many times it's not the whole story and they'll be their own doctor and they'll stop their aspirin and they right. had a stroke or a thrombotic stroke and they had an they had a stent or bypass so right and and I'm sure Dave you'll remember back in the day it used to be everybody over the age of 55 should be on a baby aspirin yeah. right and then yeah. the studies came out I believe it was in the Lancet that big trial that showed that there are some subgroups that actually can get harmed by being on aspirin yeah. you know increased bleeding risk and uh, gastrointestinal complications and then you had the opposite effect. People heard about it and in, in, uh, kind of in the news, and then they went all the way up, you know, stopping their aspirin. And you had some folks that would really benefit from being yeah. on aspirin that just stopped it. Yeah. Uh, and, and so at the end of the day, I think for our listeners, it, it comes down to talking with your, with your primary care doctor or your cardiologist and figuring out your risk factors, your specific risk factors, and whether you should be on baby aspirin or not. You know, it's not for everybody. And uh, age is not necessarily the same you know, and age is just a number, yeah. uh, and it doesn't necessarily reflect um, your general cardiovascular uh, disease and your general cardiovascular risk. And you know, they should folks should see people like you who can quantify that risk and give them recommendations about what 
medications to be on, and namely baby aspirin. Right. Agreed. Hundred percent. Um, so an, uh, one on, uh, other question, maybe one final question. Um, we can talk about this all day, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, wearables, um, like Apple Watches or or Fitbits or anything like that. Um, how do you think that they factor in? And I know there's a lot more technology now. Now they're saying that you can check your blood oxygen level with with your you know your watch or even do like an EKG with it. Right. Well, uh, you know, wearables are really cool. I, I can't deny that. And I think they will be the future of medicine. I think, I think right. we will have wearables that do lots of things, maybe even deliver drugs. Um, but right now where we are, um, I don't think we're at the point where we could say everybody should be wearing wearables. And in my own patient population, I feel anybody under 70 probably shouldn't be wearing a wearable, especially the heart rate monitor. Okay. The heart rate monitor has created so much anxiety. Because when you're sleeping, your heart rate goes really low, right? right. So my heart rate when I'm sleeping is in the 30s. Because um, you're probably an athlete. Yeah, that's who right. cares? I exercise. <laughs> I hope it's in the 30s. That's a right. good thing. You know, right. Olympic athletes may go into the 20s. Wow. But how many times do I have a patient come and say, oh, my God, I need to see you. Uh, my heart rate's going into the 40s. And they exercise every day, and they're completely asymptomatic. Right. And then how many times do I see a patient and their, their watch tells them that they went into AFib? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't AFib. It was just artifacts. So my feeling right now is it creates a lot more anxiety than it does help. Okay. Um, I personally don't use wearables. I don't like overanalyzing everything in my day. I don't need to know my oxygen level if I'm feeling <laughs> fine or my heart rate. I don't, I don't check this stuff in the gym. Um, I think over 70 is very interesting. Because as we age, the incidence of an arrhythmia called the atrial fibrillation goes up. Okay. And those are the people who may not have symptoms of this arrhythmia, but are having it, and it could cause a stroke. It would be helpful for them to know. So I think the future for wearables is definitely going to be in an older age population. Right. You know, a 90-year-old with a heart rate of 30 is very different than a 30-year-old with a heart rate of 30, right? That 90-year-old is probably getting a pacemaker. Or, or it could be indicative of underlying disease. And that needs to be looked into. The 30-year-old who's exercising when they are sleeping and they have a heart rate of 30 is probably not going to be of any um, any issue at all. So I think right now, my feeling is in some people, yes. In most people, no. No, that makes sense. Well, I think probably today's podcast has been one of the one of our more successful ones. Very much, very much interesting. Dr. Degati, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, Guys, thank you for listening in to another episode of Brain Buzz. Uh, of course, like and subscribe uh, on our YouTube channel, and we'll, we'll see you again on another episode. Thank you. <laughs>